Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Indeed he is. And we welcome you to this Easter morning worship service. We are so glad that you can be here worshiping with us. A couple of announcements before we get started. Just reminding everybody that we're still here as long as we are permitted. And the office will be open from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Monday through Friday. Uh, any, that, uh, any way you need to get in touch with us, you can call the church office. Or you can call the Crisis Care Line. Or you can email Pastor Pat or I and we'll get back to you just as soon as we are able. Um, please visit our website. There's a lot of good information there on the front page. So that's sslc.org. Um, also, there's a couple of things about today's service. We are going to have um, an offering. And so we thank everybody for all their support financially and otherwise at this time as we walk this road together. And uh, then also, as uh, today we will be having communion, we just ask that you gather the elements um, whatever you have that's appropriate in your context to share today, and we will have that communion together. Um, now we are going to have our peace. So again, on this day, uh, we're going to take a moment of silence, and we're going to think about somebody, anybody, uh, multiple people who could use God's peace on this day, and uh, we'll take a moment of silence. Let's think and pray uh, for those people now.
name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. By our baptism into the death and resurrection of Christ, God raises us up to new life. Let us confess to God our sins and all that waits for resurrection in our lives. Amen. God of grace and glory, you have brought us through the night of sin into the light of Jesus' resurrection. Yet our lives are still shadowed by sin. Make us alive in Christ, O God. Make us new as you make all things new. Rescue us from evil and the gloom of sin. Renew us in grace and restore us to living in your holiness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Rejoice with all creation around God's throne. The light of the risen Christ puts to flight all evil deeds, washes away sin, restores innocence to the fallen, casts out hate, brings peace, and humbles earthly pride. God is merciful and gracious, granting forgiveness through Jesus Christ to all who confess their sin. Now, as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by His authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the 
peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. O God, you gave your only Son to suffer death on the cross for our redemption. And by his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of death. Make us die every day to sin, that we may live with him forever in the joy of the resurrection. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the 10th chapter of Acts, beginning with the 34th verse. Peter began to speak to the people. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks to the Lord for the Lord is good. God's mercy. 
salvation echo in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord acts valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord acts valiantly. I shall not die. comes from the third chapter of Colossians, beginning with the first verse. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in, saw the linen wrappings lying there, did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings there and the cloth that had been over Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed, for as of yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? 
Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me you have laid him, and, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things unto her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. So now we're going to have our children's sermon. So I have to be honest, the last two weeks I've forgotten the most important part of our time together. Good morning! We used to always do that and I'd make you do it twice or three times right now. I'm guessing you were surprised whenever I said that so you probably didn't say anything or maybe you thought it was awkward because you're staring at a TV screen. I'm going to do it again. Good morning! Give it back to me! Alright, good job. Well, so, the reason I really thought about that is because, number one, that's our thing, right? That's what we do. But number two is, this is a very good morning. And Mary and the disciples that Pastor Pat talked about, about that day, on Easter Day, they could have used a good morning. They had been through a lot. A week Full of things. Jesus had ridden into Jerusalem as King and Messiah, and then just days later, the people turned against him and they put him on a cross and they killed him and they buried him. And the two Marys went to the tomb this morning looking to go finish burying Jesus properly. And when they get there, he's not there. And they don't know what's going on. Think about what they must have been thinking. Where is he at? Where did somebody take him? Something's wrong has happened. Somebody was really mad at him. And they've taken away our Savior. And we'll never see him again. We thought before he was just dead. But now he's dead and he's gone. They could really have used a good morning. And guess what? That's exactly what they got. The best morning ever. Because guess what? Jesus rose. And he came and he spoke to Mary. And he was alive. He wasn't gone. God had raised him up. That's why he wasn't in the tomb anymore. And all of the fear and wondering and anxiety and sadness and anger and uncertainty. All those things that the women and the disciples and Jesus' followers had all vanished because they knew the power of God and they knew that Jesus was raised from the dead. You know, some of us can use a good morning like that. Maybe some of you kiddos. I know it's been kind of scary and kind of weird not going to school, having to stay home, mom and dad's teaching you. That's crazy in and of itself, right? I mean, there's all sorts of stuff happening. And so sometimes we may wonder what's to come. But you know what? This is a good morning because it's a morning where God reaches out to all of us and shows us that we are loved. And that because God claims us in the waters of baptism, that there's nothing that can hold power over us. No virus, no anything. You are God. And God will save us and be with us no matter what. So I say to you again, good morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this wonderful, absolutely awesome morning. And we really need it, Lord, just like Mary and those needed it. We just help that, hope that you would help us to always know of your love and grace with us. And that you are powerful than anything and everything. And that you are with us no matter what, carrying us through dark times and good times. And just help us to remember that and help us to celebrate this wonderful morning because Jesus has risen. Amen.
Grace and peace to you all from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, as Pastor Jason just said, it's been an interesting few weeks. So here's my question. What have you been doing with these weeks of time out? I heard this, and I think it really is true that Netflix and Prime viewing have gone off the charts. I am certain that has been the case at the Riddle House. And in order to spice up the usual free viewing fare, because by the way, what comes on free is our staple, we came off the hip and we watched a pay-per-view movie. And don't fall out of your seats. It was an historical flick. Jan and I rented 2019 movie Midway. It retells the epic naval battle of the United States Navy and the Navy of the Empire of Japan. And this battle actually became a turning point in the Pacific conflict in World War II. But as I started watching it, what surprised me and what took me away was it began with a surprise attack on the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. And having been to Pearl Harbor and having had the honor of knowing veterans who are now gone, who had survived the attack December 7th, 1941, because my dad had a 30-year naval career that started in 1937, so I knew some of his friends who had been there. So as I watched the utter carnage of that day, it it pressed me deeply. And because of the, the desolation and, and the destruction of that raid, the United States Pacific Fleet lay broken and bent on the bottom of Pearl Harbor at around 10 o'clock that December morning. And if that day that you had been there and looked over that burning catastrophe, I suspect that you might have well thought all hope was lost. And I wondered as I watched if early in December 1941, if people who had heard about that or seen the pictures in the newspaper, because that was well before TV, if they might have seen the wreckage, they thought that things were just too broken to mend. Well, if you would, reflect with me on the truth, the timeless truth that I was honored to share with you from St. John's Gospel. Because at the first light in that garden, don't let it be lost on you that at first we overlook a scene of destruction. The text tells us that the friends of Jesus, those disciples, male and female disciples, they must have thought their Lord was just too broken to mend. And for those followers of Jesus, despair was the order of the day. Mary is crying and other disciples are going back home kind of confused. And, and even later on that day, the plot thickened. Now, there were two of Jesus' guys, two in the movement, and they were hightailing it out of town. They were getting away to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they looked back on the cataclysm of those recent days, their chins were on their chests. Their countenances were crushed, and they had blank eyes. And they had a muttered conversation. And in the midst of that, a stranger joins them. Hey, what are y'all talking about? And they said, fella, where have you been? Have you not heard what's going on in Jerusalem this week? You see, he came among us. He was a more beautiful personality than we had ever seen. He talked like no one has ever talked and healed like no one has ever healed. And from him emanated warmth and love, but now he's dead. But we had hoped. 
we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. But they broke him. And they put him underground in a tomb. We'll finish that story in two weeks. But let me ask you this. What do you do when all hope is gone? When things just seem too broken to mend. And move the stories of our day. Their, their marriage was shaky. It was hanging on by a thread. And they just prayed against hope that something would get better. But out of the blue, catastrophe after catastrophe came down upon them. Leading them at that point to turn from each other and run as hard as they could to opposite exits. What do you do when you've been hanging by a thread and the thread seemingly breaks? When things just seem too broken to mend. The doctor comes in to the room, the waiting room, with the look. The waiting ones, once keeping their worried watch, grown to their feet. And the surgeon, she looks at her shoes and she looks up and begins with those worn, weary words, I'm sorry, but. And the surgeon leaves after finishing and they simply slump back onto the couch, now bearing thousand mile blank stares. Things seem too broken to fix. And life seems to be sinking to the bottom and darkness seems to crowd out all the light. For you see, early Sunday, the Bible says, before it got light, Mary went to the tomb, Mary Magdalene. It was still dark. And she made her way in the quiet darkness. I really don't know. But what do you think's passing over her mind? I know this, she's on a pilgrimage to, to visit his broken body. And when she reached what she thought was the end point, she took in the empty tomb and I suspect she cried, Oh no, not this. They've not only beaten him and broken him, they've not only murdered him, but now they've stolen his body. Right, Magdalene. She had been an unblessed one. Forget about the erroneous conclusion that she was a woman of the streets. That isn't how the Bible tells it. What we know from the Bible, the truth is that she had been healed from the possession of seven demons. Not one, not two, not three, but seven, which is the Bible's way of saying it's a complete possession. Her life must have been framed by hopelessness and helplessness and brokenness. And in the view of the world, I suspect, it may be in her own view, Maybe she thought she was too broken to mend. But Jesus found her. And Jesus freed her from her broken bondage. And Jesus replaced demon chains with hope's light and gave her courage that in him she just might be able to hang on. That the unblessed might finally be blessed. And then came the cruel cross, and now cowering, crushed, and crestfallen before an empty tomb, the demons of despair surely welled over her because they had not only beaten him and killed him, but now they had taken his body. It seems that as of late, we have all stood cloistered and, and covered by, by happenings, moments when we too felt that there was no hope and what we had of it was slipping away. And things seemed to cave in on us. And things feel too broke to mend. And our ship seemed to sink in the harbors of our lives. Where do you go when it seems too broke to mend? I mean, here in real time in 2020, in the chaos and confusion in our world that's been brought by the virus. What do we do when things seem too broke to mend? Well, Mary was confronted by the empty tomb. And she ran away headlong, swirling in a cacophony of feelings and thoughts. And she found the other disciples, and I'm sure her words just, just flooded out. They've taken him from the tomb. I don't know where they've laid him. We don't know. And hearing this, Peter and John, they bolted, the Bible tells us. They went to the tomb. 
They bent down. They saw the linen wrappings lying there. Peter saw them, and the cloth had been rolled up on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And then the Bible says they did not at this point yet understand the scripture. He must rise from the dead. So they went back to the house. The two lads, you see, didn't have their heads or heart completely around what had happened, so they headed for home. You see, I think for them at some point, things were still broken. But for Mary, scuffing back home wasn't in the cards. So as Peter and John trudged home, she still can't leave where his broken body had been laying. For in her world, he was now both broken and gone. So her last resort is to stand at the tomb and weep. Why does she stay? Where else does she have to go? In less than 48 hours before this moment, she had seen him murdered like a common criminal. No doubt she stayed, saw him dead, taken off the cross, broken and bent, carried to the grave. So on this Easter day, she stands by an empty grave, bathed in salty tears. You see, she went because even a dead Jesus is better than no Jesus. But now, it all seems bent and broken beyond repair. And did you catch the power in the story? My goodness, it just crackles because she is so aimless and so adrift that when Jesus speaks to her, she doesn't even recognize his voice. Jesus speaks to her and she says, if, if you're the gardener, why don't you tell me what has happened to his body? And now bursting into the valley of the shadow of death come the words that change everything from then to today into forever. She must have turned to leave and, and Jesus with his back to her, speaks her name, Mary. He calls her by name, and she turns to him. And in a simple word, in a singular sound, praise be to God, all darkness turns to light, and all hopelessness turns to hope. Listen for Easter, because Jesus calls her name. You see, the things that are too broke are now mended. And they are fixed into forever because Mary hears him and she turns around and she says, Rabboni, my teacher, my dear master. She seeks to grab around his legs and hug him and he says, no, Mary, I'm, I'm different. I'm, I'm of my father now, but go and tell my disciples I will see you again. And with heart pounding and tear-filled eyes and feet flying with joy, she runs back as hard as she can and she tells the disciples, it's true, he's alive, I've seen him. Thanks be to God. Because you see, so often in problems and suffering and hopelessness and darkness and brokenness in our lives, we hear the voice of God, a God who promises never to abandon us. And you see, she heard him and in her need, he found her. You see, that's the beauty of the story. Mary didn't find Jesus. Jesus found her. Her. She came looking for a dead Christ, not a risen one, and all the while Jesus was looking for her. And, and on this Easter day, in all the midst of the brokenness and all the scattering that's going on around us, I remind this old heart, and I remind you, the good news, that Jesus loves you. And he looks for you, and he looks for me, and he's unrelenting. He is hope in the midst of your hopelessness. It is hope that is looking for you. And he is light in your darkness shining on you. He who can mend the brokenness in our lives and in our world is looking for us and seeking for us. For here is the forever truth. The truth that can never be taken from you and that you can base your life upon. It is the Easter truth that no matter what happens around you, nothing is too bent 
or too broken for him to raise and restore. For know this, my dear loved ones, God has spoken, speaks, and will speak your name. Know that God has, will, and will forever have the last word in our lives. And the reason for that truth is this truth. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia, and amen. Now profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Rejoicing in the wonder of new life in Jesus Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. For the church that built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, we may be witnesses of the hope revealed through His death and resurrection. Lord, in Your mercy, hear our prayer. For our world, in this time of disease, disorder, and death, that we may be touched by your healing, held in your hope, and restored by your life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the terrified and those consumed by anxieties and mysteries and sufferings of this world, that they may receive consolation from the body of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our congregation, that this Easter day we may be awakened to the joy of new life. Be with those who in this crisis persevere, serve, help, and provide for those in need, especially those whose lives are diminished by loneliness, loss, illness, or grief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who have died in the faith and for those who still journey on earth, that buried with Christ in baptism, we may rise to sing the unending Easter victory song. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Accept these prayers and the prayers of our hearts, O God, for the sake of the crucified and risen, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and our Lord. Amen. Oh, oh, oh. 
Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you, lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection with earth and sea and all their creatures and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim we praise your name and join their unending hymn. You are worthy of our thanks and praise, Lord God of truth, for by the breath of your mouth you have spoken your word and all things have come into being. You fashioned us in your image and placed us in the garden of your delight. Though we chose the path of rebellion, you would not abandon your own. Again and again you drew us into your covenant of grace. You gave your people the law and taught us by your prophets to look for your reign of justice and mercy. Lord, you are the most holy one, enthroned in splendor and light. Yet in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, who suffered for the salvation of the world, you reveal the glory and power of your love. Embracing our humanity, he taught us the way of salvation. Loving us to the end, he gave himself to death for us. Dying for his own, he set us free from the bonds of sin, that we might rise and reign with him in glory. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the death that He suffered on the cross. We celebrate His resurrection, His bursting from the tomb, and we long for His coming in glory. Father, by Your Holy Spirit, let these gifts of Your creation be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and form us into the likeness of Christ. Look with favor on Your people and in Your mercy hear the cries of our hearts. Bless the earth, heal the sick, Free the oppressed and fill your church with power from on high. Gather your people from the ends of the earth to feast with all your saints at the table in your kingdom where the new creation is brought to perfection in Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory be yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. May God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who has brought us from death to life fill you with great joy and bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Now go in peace to share the good news that Christ is risen. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Happy Easter, everybody.